strength, courage, and wisdom, I think is a pretty good description of how I know Tony Butler. Um, Tony resides up in Singapore with myself and, of course, um, Angela, and uh, has helped me build the, the Asia business over the last few years, of which I am deeply, deeply grateful. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for that, Tony Butler. Um, a fun fact. So everyone has someone that often kind of directs their career. And interesting, well, interesting for, for me, maybe not to anyone else, is for Tony Butler and myself, that is the same person. And they, uh, a, a love, wonderful friend, Helen, um, and I'm not going to go into the story, but she was instrumental in, um, in us being here, working together and actually came up to Singapore to visit. But anyway, just on that, as coaches, of course, we often do have that impact where there is a a, a, a shift in the direction or someone makes a decision as a result of the coaching work that we do. And this session um, is a panel session with, with, with Tony and she'll introduce the, the panelists, Angela Fold and Colleen Deacon um, on finding and working with a coach. So Tony Butler, over to you. John, thank you so much. And um, thank you again, Colleen and Angela for, for joining me today in this conversation around finding and working with a coach. Maybe I just um, thought I'd put a little bit of context around this very briefly before I introduce you to Colleen and Angela, or they might introduce themselves. Um, and, and just say what, what's important or what's the purpose of looking at this particular topic today? And I guess for some of you out there, you might be sellers of coaching. So you know, if you're a seller of coaching, then it probably makes sense for you to think about what do buyers need or want from me? Um, either from that coaching relationship um, or from me as a coach. And of course, if you're a buyer of coaching, whether that you're as an individual seeking a coach or as an organisation representing um, a, you know, either you know, representing various leaders who need coaching or helping to um, develop that sort of coaching capability in your organisation, and I imagine that there will be a significant range of criteria that you might need to be considering as you um, think about who you're working with um, and how you want to develop those relationships. I think part of this is remembering that the coaching industry today is probably in the vicinity of about $15 billion US. It's one of the estimated um, values. In 2019, it was estimated at 15 billion US dollars with a predicted annual growth of 6.7%. So with that much money sitting on the table, that says there's great opportunity, but it's also great risk, um, especially for the buyers of coaching to ensure that they're you know, investing in those funds wisely. I think about this in terms of putting my old, very retired, very ragged HR hat on and think about, you know, when I was wanting to buy the services or, you know, look at service providers to work and partner with me in my organ in, in the organizations I was representing. You know, some of the really broad criteria might be things like, you know, how do I ensure that they've got the quality, the experience, and the reputation that's important and that matches my organization? Um, how do we ensure that we get really high return on investment and value for money? Um, and importantly, what's the sort of working relationship or partnership or alliance? that we want to establish here. Um, is this for the short term or is this more for long term? And these are just some of the considerations that I know I took on board when I was, when I was in that space. The other thing around coaching in particular is it's often quite an individualized service. And more often than not, particularly, um, of course, with individual coaching, as you would all appreciate, is that there's very little transparency around what takes place within the confines of the coaching relationship. So how do we as buyers of coaching and uh, those who are responsible for ensuring value from the coaching actually make these assessments with greater confidence and competence? So in talking about this sort of fairly broad topic in some respects, um, it could probably go in lots of different directions. Um, I've invited um, some people that we work with 
uh, to just lend some different perspectives around this. Um, so sharing some of their war stories, perhaps, some of their insights and experiences around this idea of finding and working with a coach or coaches as the case may be. So let me introduce you to Colleen Deacon. Colleen is the Manager for Leadership and Professional Development with Newcrest Mining, and I believe based in Melbourne. We haven't otherwise had the, the pleasure of meeting, so thank you, Colleen. Um, and we have Angela Fields, who is a coach connector and is the founder of The Power Within. And The Power Within is an actual organization that matches coaches with those looking for coaches. Um, so perhaps Colleen, if I can in invite you first to um, perhaps introduce yourself and share a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Tony. And thank you for the opportunity um, to join you today. Um, so I work with uh, Newcrest Mining. Um, we are an a growing organisation, an international mining company. With uh, we specialise in gold mining, um, with a with a very healthy uh, copper uh, byproduct or kind of offset, if you like. Um, we operate uh, two uh, large mines in Australia: one in um, the Hunter Valley in Orange, one in the East Pilbara. We have a large mine in Papua New Guinea, um, in a place called Lahia, in the middle of the Ring of Fire in the ocean. Um, and we have two, um, two mines in, in British Columbia in Canada, not far from Vancouver. So um, we, uh, you know, so we have a quite a, a, a diverse um, footprint um, and uh, we have approximately around 5,000 permanent employees and 12,000 um, if you take into account our contract population as well. Um, so a lot of our work, uh, we work with, um, I work with you know, a lot of specialists, a lot of engineers and uh, technical specialists who, um, who like to get uh, technical support. So, um, you know, the, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but um, in terms of what we do, um, you know, the, in Melbourne, we have a head office of about three, 400 people. Um, and uh, yeah, my role is to really support um, the capability of our, our mainly our leaders um, in terms of their, their, the way that they show up, um, how they live our values and um, deliver, to help to deliver on our, our aspirations. Um, we know that, um, you know, what got us to where we were, you know, 10 years ago is not going to get us to where we want to be, you know, in 2025. So um, shifting and um, enabling our leaders to, um, to progress and evolve, to be more inclusive um, and to, um, you know, sustain a workforce of people who feel like they belong is, is going to really enable us to really get to, to, our, um, to our aspiration. So, so coaching is a big part of that. So I'll, um, I'll leave it there and we can talk a bit more about that. About that sure, shortly. we look forward to it, Colleen, and thank you. And I do remember coaching some new Chris. Um, leaders several years ago now, in fact. So it's, um, it's uh, when I was working on the west coast of Australia. So, yeah. Angela, let's uh, invite your voice into the room. Thanks, Tony. And thank you for inviting me here. Um, so I am the coach connector and the founder of The Power Within. Um, and we help uh, organizations and individuals unlock their potential. So I work with a diverse range of co coaches. It's not just leadership and executive coaching. I also have wellness, confidence coaches, uh, and again, looks after both organizations as well as individuals. Um, so with the coaches in the network as well, um, as I mentioned, they can do leadership programs through to corporate workshops and speaking engagements and that one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. Uh, and the idea behind uh, the power within is that everything we need is already within us and it's just, we just have to discover it, which is really what a coach can help clients do. And so my role as the coach connector is ensuring that it's the right fit. So ensuring that whatever the client needs is matches with the coach. So on both sides as well, because it's really imperative to have a really strong coaching relationship to make it that strong impact. So um, I'm happy to talk about further with you, Tony, but we are, you know, that's basically what I do. So I will look at the client and all their objectives and what they're trying to achieve. And then I will match them with a coach in the network. Fantastic. Well, no doubt that both of you have got some rich experience to bring to the conversation today. So thank you again. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit, perhaps, Colleen, from you first, just to, to understand 
how are you or what's your experience of, of using coaching in your various roles and organisations? And I know you've worked across a variety of industry sectors. Mm, mm. Um, so, you know, what's your, what are you noticing around, around those themes? Um, yeah, I've been in and around um, coaching for maybe 15 years and I was very lucky um, I led a team um, in Melbourne um, in our, what our, I worked in, ba in banking finance and we had an academy, um, a sort of a business school. And I was fortunate enough to, to, to lead a team of um, organisational psychologists and um, specialists who, who taught me so much and really, um, uh, you know, enabled me to really understand what is coaching and what is good coaching um, and what is not. Um, and the reason why we needed to, to do that was because we were managing our talent programs for our organisation and our leadership programs. And a big part of um, that uh, experience was to participate in coaching and informal executive coaching. And so at that time, um, we were working with IECL. So we were working um, with coaches there I mean, this is going back, yeah, 15 years ago. I've got a 17-year-old son. It was before he was born, actually. Um, so um, we had really early exposure and the opportunity to understand, you know, what, what are the elements and the kind of what's important when selecting coach. Um, I personally also um, have completed my Level 2 IUCL. So I've been personally um, in, in and around and, and really value um, what coaching brings more as a, a kind of a leader as coach. Um, that's something that I prescribe to and encourage um, and have done for, for a long time. Um, being more coach-like um, and curious and asking questions is a far more valuable type of leadership than to be kind of telling and directing our people, you know, telling them what to do. It's far more sustainable. Um, so I learned early around what was important. Um, I learned, um, I understood, you know, the value of, um, accreditation like ICF and having coaches who've been trained, supervised, um, you know, observed um, in, in the field um, and, and the opportunity, that, because it's such a significant investment when you do go down that path that um, um, really having confidence that, uh, you know, those conversations that are happening privately between the coachee and the coach are, are of maximum benefit that you're getting, um, you know, you kind of, Reducing that, um, you know, the unknown and, you know, possible, I guess, possibly some risk that could come with having um, setting up a coaching relationship with someone who doesn't have, um, you know, the training that I think is really important. Um, so, so that's been my experience, and, and I've sort of kept that. And I've, and I'm not a purist around coaching because I think there's there's many different types of coaching, but it's being really conscious about what time, what coaching is it time for now, uh, and sometimes. Um, executive coaching is is the right solution, uh, but sometimes um, our leaders need to be more coach like in how they are leading their teams, and 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 you know so there's a real mixture. And then other times there are there's a need for more technical coaching, and and we do we do dip into that space as well at, from time to time. So yeah, I think that's something that really has has stayed with me um, since being uh, in that role all those years ago, um, and I've brought that into my current role. I've been at Newcrest for nearly five years. So um, very, there was when I joined, there was very um, limited understanding of what coaching was and is. Um, it was very, it was purely a technical solution um, and often an outsourced solution. Um, and, uh, you know, we've kind of been working with that for a few years now at Newcrest, and uh, it's just going from strength to strength. And uh, if I think about... Um, Three years ago, if I had have proposed uh, a coaching, um, coaching as a solution for a leader, and it was through virtual coaching, I think you know I would have got probably a bit of pushback um, and challenge. Um, and now it's just what you do. There's just there's just no question that um, that that is an effective model. Um, obviously, face to face is great as well, but it's not it's not the be all and end all. So um, that's kind of my it's been my experience um, so far. Yeah, huge variety in there, and hearing that whole piece around you know not only your role in 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 the coaching, but also how organisations are using coaching for to support executives, to support learning initiatives, to support individuals, etc. And interesting to hear that shift even from seventeen years ago to even more recently as to that level of readiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Angela, what are you noticing that's either similar or different to Colleen's experience in terms of what organisations or, or, or buyers of coaching are, are seeking and you know, how are they using coaching in their lives or their organisation? Actually, what I'm, I'm finding is that sometimes, not all, but sometimes the clients aren't necessarily know what they need. So it's about working with the team uh, of the coaches, the, the network I work with are coaches, facilitators, mentors, knowledgeable experts. So it's about understanding what that client needs because sometimes coaching is not the answer, as Colleen said before. Sometimes it might be training or mentorship that they're after. So it's about really identifying when you would use coaching for an organisation. So what I'm really seeing amongst the organisations is really having those very clear um, steps to identifying what they need first and then that's when I will be able to recommend to them what's the next step in terms of coaching okay how is that going to work what does that look like uh, and then looking at for example if it's a leadership program you know who's involved how many coaches what's involved what are they trying to achieve what's the outcome they're trying to achieve so again it for me it's very much about identifying that outcome and the impact that that organization is trying to achieve. Mm, yeah. yeah. There was an, an article on the internet recently who suggested that coaching was disrupting leadership development. Mm. And it raises that whole question around what's fit for purpose, which is, I think, mm. what you're both talking to here. So yeah. when leaders come to you with a request for coaching or perhaps in your work, as you say, you know, someone's recommending coaching to them, how do you make that determination? that coaching is indeed the right intervention? Question for either of you. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes it's not. I, I, I kind of I have a conversation about tell me more, tell me why mm. you're looking for coaching. What is it you're trying to, what are you trying to solve? Um, and sometimes it's um, a really obvious opportunity. We've got someone who's been identified as a high potential successor and we want to support them, um, their growth and development. Um, you know, but then there's also... What, what conversations have you had with that individual? Um, for me, it's there's there's what are we as you said, Angela? What are we trying to get from this? What are we trying to try mm. to achieve here? Uh, and that time is so important. Um, but it's also then what does the individual want to, to achieve? Um, it's one thing for an organisation to want something from somebody, but if it's just not the right time, um, that that uh, engagement will be challenged and possibly at risk. And, and I have seen, um, you know, a small number of those where it just wasn't, we, we weren't aligned uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the solution and but also the timing for that individual. Um, so I really do spend that time, um, especially when I see the word or hear the word remedial or um, this person struggling um, it's, it's, you know, that's something that I would sit down and have a conversation with them. Usually it's with their manager because usually mm -hmm. the individual in an internal coaching engagement, usually the internal person um, is probably the last to know. Um, and, uh, and so there is a conversation with their HR manager and let's talk about this. Um, this is a commitment, you know, it's around six months, you know, possibly longer um, to talk me through um, why you think this is the right solution and what are you trying to solve. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a re really important stage in the process um, and then we go from there and sometimes it's like it's not the right time it's not the right solution mm -hmm. let's 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 discuss this further and, and we'll, we'll um, you know continue it but not necessarily engage a coach mm -hmm. so there's that level of readiness for the, uh, by the leader and, mm -hmm. and that clarity in terms of what they want to achieve yeah Angela you're going to share something I was just going to add to that to Colleen to say that you know, it's about us being very clear on what the role of the coach is, but also being very clear with the organisation as well about the role of mentorship or training or whatever may be required. So that's how I would distinguish in terms of when coaching is most appropriate solution versus something else that we can, we can put together for them. So um, as I said, coaching and mentoring sometimes gets very confused. And I think it's just about I, like being very clear and clarifying those roles. And it sounds like there's, a, there's an educative component in there as well for mm -hmm. the likes of you, Angela, or I imagine for other coaching providers to, to explore, to be able to explore that fully and, and be able to 
I guess, lend their expertise and advice into the organisation or the leader that they're working with. Would that be true? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what is, you know, testing their knowledge around what, what do you, what, what is, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's not always what people think. Yeah, uh, yeah. absolutely. But, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. when I, yeah, I had no idea what a coach was when I first worked with a coach, you know, I was saying, can you tell me the answer? And that's exactly what coaching is. And so <laughs> it's about knowing, you know, again, going through it, you now know how powerful, I know how powerful coaching is. But as Colleen's saying, it's about understanding the, what's the right solution and if it's at the right time for the organisation. Yeah. So assuming it is the right solution, coaching is, is, is the answer, so to speak. It is an unregulated industry. And Colleen, you alluded to the, you know, the ICF and having accreditation, et cetera, et cetera. You know, anyone in this industry can hang out their shingle and call themselves a coach. How do you go about assessing the quality and the capability of the coaches that you're bringing into your organisations or the, to matching, in your case, Angela, to the leaders you're working with? So the process that I take when I am looking to collaborate with a coach is a few steps involved before they join the network. So the first one is just really understanding the type of coaches that they are, because as I said before, I've got quite a diverse network. It's not just leadership coaching, but understanding the type of coach that they are, the type of people that they support. Um, And for me, it's a really strong one is understanding why they are a coach. What's their coaching mission? Because I believe that working with a coach that really strong values and purpose always allows for, I feel like, a more effective conversation with the the counterparts and the organisation. And then then the second step really is then to have a really deep dive session with this coach. So that's really understanding what value this coach can bring to their clients. So that's everything from their offering, their programs, their pricing, everything, their approach, their style, everything so that uh, I have a deeper understanding as to the type of client that would work best with this coach. And then uh, the coaches have to coach me. So, you know, I, I like to see them in action because that I, again, will understand their approach and style and how they are as a coach. And then I assess. And then as Colleen before, all the qualifications. So all the coaches are um, certified. Uh, and if not, I have got one who's, but she's had over 10 years of experience in working in that field, but she acts more as a, um, a trainer slash consultant. So not um, coaching as such. Okay, so you're looking at their coaching philosophy, their training, their Absolutely, yeah. certifications, et cetera. Yes. Yeah. And I'm also hearing there's that bit about just understanding their style as yeah. an individual, that relationship. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Colin, what would you add? I wouldn't add much more. I think I think maybe my way is a bit more a bit of the lazy way in that I I guess we partner with ICL and I, I want you to do all that work for us. <laughs> Indeed we do. <laughs> There's, with that relationship comes comes a kind of trust that you have yeah you have vetted and you you are taking people on coaches who do kind of meet that that requirement so um but at the same time I, we have engaged other types of coaches in different contexts and so um accreditation is the first thing that i look for um to it's probably to the annoying a few a few internal leaders they just want to get it done you know they want to just make a decision and and you know I think it's it's a it's a worthwhile investment in time and um to for an and from an from an assurance perspective I can't speak this afternoon mm-hmm. um because you know at the end of the day you know I, I I apply the same lens as they would apply if they were bringing in a a technical expert to fix one of the conveyor belts or something like that they're just not going to take anyone who says they're a, you know they're qualified is that they need to have their ticket or they need to have their certification and and it's the same thing when you're dealing with the the types of topics that a, a coach mm. is working on um, why why wouldn't you expect that those those individuals are, are trained and um, you know qualified to be able to, to take on those roles so they're a big they're, they're, they're important roles and um, can affect the the careers and performance of the organisation on and those individuals. So that's that's the kind of my pushback to them. Um, mm. So it's as equally as important as a technical skill. 
you know, no, no, they, we could have a whole different conversation around, you know, the pros and cons of accreditation in this unregulated industry. And I think that conversation has been had many times before. But what I'm hearing that in there really is it's at least one benchmark that gives us a degree of confidence in the decisions we're making, that it's not the only thing. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a bit of a challenging question. Have you ever got it wrong? You know, chosen a coach or chosen someone that you say, oh, man, that was that was just a total mismatch. I have. <laughs> yeah. This was my own personal journey, though. So this is not someone who I've recommended out. Um, so as I said, many, many years ago, when I first was looking for a coach, I, I think the issue there was that I wasn't really sure what the role of the coach was and I wasn't really sure what I was looking for. So it was, you know, I'd gone and decided to have a session with a coach and it just didn't work. I just I didn't open up. I just didn't feel like that trust was there. Um, and one of the key elements I always think to an effective coaching conversation is about having that trust, having that safe space so that you can open up to the coach. Uh, and so I, I think I tried maybe two or three sessions and after that, I just said, no, it's just, it wasn't good return on investment for me. But since then, I've worked with so many other coaches where it's been really powerful. And so one of the key areas for me, again, is just saying to understand having that connection and trust built early on is so important for that coaching relationship. Mm. Yeah. That's my own personal experience, though. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Well, you know, and, and that was, I'm imagining you had the opportunity to meet that coach before you started working with them. It was just a chemistry call. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and, you know, that's one of the things I know we do in IACL. We often, you know, not every, pro not every coaching program has that opportunity. I know organisations sometimes when they're, you know, um, coaching many, many people, there isn't that opportunity to have that chemistry session or what we call a mm. meet and greet. Mm. And so there isn't always that, that, that option to choose your coach, although there's always an option to change your coach. Mm what what else might contribute when i don't know when when things have gone wrong what are what other, other things have you noticed have contributed to those mismatches when you know, um colin i'm sure in the volumes of coaching that you've seen go on in the organization you know, what tends to be interfere with the success yeah and i think i touched on it earlier what one that jumps out that that it, like they went the individual went through the whole program the, the process but yeah, you know, I did a feedback conversation with him afterwards and, you know, he had a different understanding of what coaching was. He was someone who was, um, he said, you know, the timing, he said he just had his first child. He was acting in a job in the Pilbara and he's working from Melbourne and he was got promotion. It was just all going on in his life. And he's, he's kind of, we use the insights profile as quite, um, quite high red energy, energy in the way he kind of shows up. Um, likes to get it done, be fast, is quite extroverted, you know, uh, competitive. He wanted a coach. He wanted a, someone to kind of be kind of like an instructor. He wanted someone to be on his, to give him the steps and how to manage and navigate through all of those personal and work transitions that he was experiencing. Um, and so for him, he said it, it sort of fell a bit short. It fell short because the expectation probably was, was sort of misaligned for, from what it actually was. Um, I think that maybe my, my personal view is in a couple of years, I reckon he would be a brilliant candidate for coaching. Um, but right now, I, I feel that this is, this is about two years ago now, I think it was just the wrong intervention at the wrong time for him. He probably needed a mentor. He needed someone who has had um, that, you know, experiences that, that he could learn from and he could have a... a uh, kind of a candid conversation with um so that was an example of where um it and it's something that I you kind of it sits with you is when you do engage a coach or you do a partnership is that you are um you are really aligned around what coaching is and, and I ask those questions you know take me through what do you think what do you think coaching is what do, what do you mm. get out of it uh, before I even contact IECL Mm, mm. So there's a lot more going on in the background before we before we even get to that point of let's even have a meet and greet. Yeah, yeah. I think that's something that's often undervalued and underappreciated is quite how much work sometimes needs to be done. It doesn't need to do loads of work, but you know, there's a couple of conversations in there with 
the leader, their stakeholders in the organization, just to be really clear around what is it we're doing, why are we doing it, what's the you know, what's the value we're looking for. Yeah. Lovely shares, thank you. I mentioned earlier that you know there's that coaching relationships are quite opaque. So how do you assess and measure the return on investment of coaching? You know, I know my colleague Renee started off the session with a little bit of stuff around the impact. But what, have you, what do you expect of the coaches that you work with or your coaching providers in this regard? Well, I'm happy to go. I mean, we've had, we have sort of two different ways that we engage ICL. One is in more of that group format. Um, you know, groups of 10 or 12 leaders um, participating, you know, they're all together at the beginning, um, paired off with their coaches and then they're, um, they're off, you know, on the program and then we reconnect at the end. And there's usually a, a baseline measurement. Um, so we, we assess, um, you know, key criteria at the beginning and then at the end to sort of see measure is there has there been a shift. We've only done one of those cohorts. We've got two more coming up soon, so we'll look forward to that. Um, but in the one-to-one -one partnerships, um, you know, that's it's, it's quite um, qualitative and it's a conversation. So the coaching has the usual you know, chemistry conversation, um, the one-on-one -on -one with the counterpart and the coach, and then there's a three-way with the manager as well. Um, that's where the conversation's around opportunity, expectations, goals might come up um, and then that's revisited at the end. But then we have a conversation with, um, with both of those parties um, afterwards to talk about, you know, expect, did, did we did it meet expectations? What sort of impact, what changes have you seen, uh, what have you experienced um, as a result of the coaching um, opportunity? So. So he's, um, it's not a formal measurement um, for the one-on-ones, um, the, the individual coaching contracts, but it, um, it's certainly something that we do um, we do check in on with leaders and individuals. Mm -hmm. Colleen, in, in the absence of sort of strong quantitative data around that, you know, what you're describing is very qualitative, as you said. Oh, did, I say, you... did I say quantitative? No, I think you said qualitative. I did. I said in the absence of quantitative data, how do you continue to... Um, yeah, um, have your organisation, you know, be willing to continue to invest in coaching? Uh, well, I guess the, the, because they keep coming back and asking for more. Um, the leaders who have had great success with team members who've been through coaching seem to come back and, and request further coaching. Um, for, for other team members so they 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 experience the value um, of that investment through within their teams and with the product productivity or performance um, but but generally the candidates who are participating in coaching are um, uh, um, you know high potential high performing kind of individuals so um, you know rarely have we had um, people who've been put kind of proposed to do coaching who are you know underperforming um so so it's realizing that so sometimes from time to time um you know they outgrow the organization after going through coaching and they um they they you know sometimes can leave the organization and that's okay too right that that happens um and uh it doesn't mean we don't we don't go further coaching you know with other individuals so it's a it's it's been um proving its value over and over again. That's why we have kind of repeat, I guess, repeat business. Um, Fantastic, yeah. Angela, what do you notice about the, the, the potential, you know, there's, there's always some challenges around this, you know, measuring the ROI of coaching. Yeah. yeah, and I think sometimes, I mean, I echo everything that Colleen just said then by, well, so sometimes it is difficult to articulate that value that coaching can bring. So, a lot is dependent on ensuring that, as I said, right at the start, ensuring that we identify what the objectives are, what the outcome is, and checking in throughout those one-on-one -on -one sessions with both the coach and um, the counterpart and any other relevant stakeholders just to see how it's going. And then at the end, again, evaluating that outcome, seeing if there was, um, you know, was there change? 
was it the outcome that the organization wanted? As, as Colleen mentioned before, sometimes people outgrow that organization after coaching. Lots of realization happens throughout this time. So, uh, yeah, it's, I think for me, it's just about very much similar to what Colleen was saying before. It's about ensuring that we always get feedback and giving feedback to the coaches as well, which is ensuring that there's progress being made on both sides and getting that testimonial from the client. And you know that I think when a client comes back uh, and asks to work with a particular coach or to work with TPW, it's a, a sign that they have seen value in it. Yeah, I guess another you know another value that I would hope that coaching providers and certainly one that I know in ICL we try to do is to, is to think about what's the value add that we can bring in the relationship. Mm. Um, you know, how do we support and enable you and your organisation and its mission and vision? You know, to how we can use coaching in, in service of your your ambitions. How do you, you know, what's been your experience in terms of, you know, imagine if there are others like yourselves in the room today, you know, what could they and should they expect from their coaching provider partners to ensure that coaching is seen as a, as a positive development initiative and, you know, and what else would you expect from them, from that relationship to support you and the work that you're doing? Um, well, we have a, sorry, I'm like keep jumping. No, no, it's okay, please go ahead. We have a, um, a really open relationship with um, Marcus and Shona at ICL and they, um, you know, we talk about the individual coaching engagements, but it's much broader than that. So we're, um, we're dipping into other opportunities at ICL um, because, because um, we've been sharing what you're doing with other organisations and it sort of sparked opportunities for us. So around leader as coach training, we've got a group of an EGM and group of general managers about to embark on leader as coach training, which we're very excited about um, in terms of the opportunity that that might present for further, further growth around the organisation. Um, that was never in the plan for us to, to, to utilise that, but that's only through our conversations. Um, you know, opportunities for transition coaching, um, for, you know, new general managers being parachuted into another country in a new job, promoted you know that's a, just a perfect opportunity for someone to do kind of a 90-day transition coaching to really help them um, you know land and and um, have the the desired impact so so starting to get to know our business and knowing um, what are some opportunities that maybe we don't even realize um, there could be um, that we could tap into because often you know in our our, our organization and, and probably lots of others it's you know when, when there's a when there's a need they, they want a pretty quick, a quick response, a quick um, solution, if possible. Um, so that's that's been our experience, um, and that's what's helped us to be able to kind of respond quite quickly. Mm. And if I'm listening in there, Colleen, I'm also hearing that you know you're a very you know you're a large organisation, you've got global reach. So having a coaching provider that can match that capability for your business would also be important. I'm imagining if you're a smaller business, then your needs might be a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. Angela, what would you add? Um, just going back to your question before about the expectations, I think, again, it's about bringing the coaching together with the client and understanding the roles uh, that the, the coach would play. And also for the coach to understand what their role is for within that organisation. So what is that objective that they the organization is trying to achieve or whether or not it's a one-on-one -on -one, what that relationship looks like what can they expect from the coach at every session um, where are they planning to move from so point a to point b what does that look like and how it will work so again it's being very clear on those expectations and uh, again again also identifying those other opportunities that colleen also mentioned as well um, yeah i think that's you know there's always room for growth and Every, everybody and every organization works differently. So it's about uh, seeing those opportunities as well and seeing where they can be best placed, I guess. Yeah. 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 I'm going to pick up a couple of messages in the, in the chat. There's one to me here saying, um, could we ask 
Colleen and Angela about coachee feedback, especially as it relates to the person's direct manager and how working relationships can be improved outside of coaching. Adam, maybe if you want to bring your voice into the room and just put some, put some context or life around your question, I'm more than happy to have you take yourself off mute. So coachy feedback. Yeah. Oh, so are you waiting for someone to come off mute? Yeah. Well, I thought my Adam might, might want to ask his question directly. No? Sorry, noisy home. He'll try to come on. Yeah, <laughs> the joys of working from home. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Um, yeah, so coachy feedback on their experience. Uh, um, and the direct manager relationship outside of the coaching, yeah. Yeah, it's critical. It's so important. You know, it goes back to what I was saying about, um, uh, you know, that is the right solution, um, that it's not, you're not sort of outsourcing a problem or something to a coach, is that, um, you know, at the heart of coaching, the leader has to have a belief in the potential of that person to, you know, perform, to progress, to achieve. And if that doesn't exist, well, you know, we've got to, potential issue um, so so you know we have all different ways that that um, it can be kind of kicked off with that three-way conversation um, sometimes it's a there's a three six like a sort of 360 interview process that sometimes happens and that can really help to um, bring in you know context and feedback into that early conversation um, you know if someone is keen to you know there might be some challenges that they're trying to kind of work through but they don't quite understand so it's a it's a it's a nice sort of effective way to to get get feedback and kind of get moving pretty quickly rather than doing kind of 360 profiles and things like that um, so yeah I think that's an important part of the process of the success of this you know I also get that sometimes we have high potential individuals who maybe just don't click with their boss and uh, you know that happens and uh, you know you need to kind of manage that um, for whatever reason, um, there's there's things that you know, I would just take that as a bit of an exception, but uh, it does happen from time to time. Adam, does that answer your question? It does. Hopefully, I'm keeping the noise down successfully <laughs> at the moment. But thank you. Really, I was interested in that feedback loop because you can. I think there's such valuable information between coach and coachee, and how that, I guess, with permissions, can come back and be used for the organisation on both sides the coachee and the direct manager involved. So yeah. that really helps. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Angela, would you add anything else? Uh, I think Colleen's answered it. I think the only thing I would really answer, I think in terms of the coachee feedback, sometimes uh, we, I think we talked about it earlier, but it's about often we may see why a person is being coached in an organisation and do they want to be? Because that can also affect that feedback comes back. So about thinking about whether or not that counterpart is ready to be coached is a really big piece in that whole feedback part. So I think that that's the challenge that the coach will have um, when they start that coaching relationship, but building on it, but going towards the end, when you have that feedback, it is absolutely critical for both uh, counterpart, coach and the organisation to have that feedback shared. Lovely. Um, Angela, a question for you. you know, yes. Imagine that you've got this wonderful breadth of coaches in, in your community. You know, how do you think about utilising the full breadth of that, of that capability? You know, oftentimes we've got newer coaches, you've got more experienced coaches. So how do you think about you know, supporting and enabling all of those coaches with their various needs and skills. Thank you, Tony. It's actually something that I'm working on right now. So I'm leveraging the network better because I have, as I said before, leadership coaches to wellness coaches. And what I'm finding more now is that there's a need to tap into all of those different specialties that the coaches may have. So it's about working with an organization to say, okay, not not only do we do leadership coaching, but let's let's look at the well-being of your employees, or how do we bring in the employee engagement? And all of the different coaches have their own specialties. It's about knowing what their superpower is and bringing them together as a network to be able to help an organization. 
Um, so for example, I'm creating a program now for small business owners. Um, so it's working with a digital marketing coach, um, a business strategy slash consultant, as well as a mindset coach. And that's for small business owners who are about to go into that growth stage. They're sort of one to three years in and they're thinking about growing. So it's tapping into those different coaches and helping a small business grow and doing the same for organizations further down the line, seeing what are those different opportunities again and not just having it sort of siloed. Yeah, yeah. So really putting a system around them. Yeah, and just leveraging their knowledge and their, their specialty. Yeah, yeah. There's a, thank you. There's a question in the chat from um, the person called Guest One wanting us to dumb this down from corporate HR. I'm wondering if you might be able to just bring your voice into the room and help us understand your question or comment so that we can help and, and, and speak to that with you. Is Guest One still there? Okay, so look, from where I sit, the people that I deal with, this concept of mentor, business coach, they just meld in to one. And I heard Colleen talking briefly. Uh, I, they didn't want a coach, they wanted a mentor. And I kind of found those that distinction almost irrelevant in the small to medium business environment. Um, and so when I listen to a lot of the comments that are flowing through, what I hear is that sort of corporate HR, um, organisational sort of conversation as opposed to sort of a really uh, identified sort of, how do I put this, how to focus on uh, uh, an owner operator's uh, business problems. Now, Angela just touched momentarily there before on uh, coaching around that SME, developing a growth mindset, those sorts of things. But in a small business, you, you're never going to get to that point unless you uh, de-stress this individual, uh, help them work through, declutter, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And those two concepts are just synonymous, mentor, mm -hmm. business coach. Thank you. Thank you. Angelou, this is you know, very much, I think, sits in your space as well. I'm wondering if there's something else that you would like to share around that. Yeah, and thank you for sharing that comment. Um, I think for some of the smaller business owners that uh, I work with, uh, again, it's just identifying what they need. Sometimes it could be a hybrid relationship. Sometimes they do need to talk about coaching where, um, let's just say, it's the, the founder of the business needs to bring more awareness of themselves and how they are and how they're managing the business or how they're managing their team. But in other instances, as you're saying, it could be, uh, as Colleen mentioned before, a, a mentoring style where someone's brought in or bringing in their experience of how they've handled the situation or how they've grown a business, what they've done um, operations side or how they've developed a team and that's a very different distinction between the coaching and the mentoring so I hope that's a bit clearer because it can definitely be a hybrid relationship absolutely it's just about identifying at that time what that person needs mm. or what the business yeah, and, needs. And, and, and in that case the, the first example you go it might be a whole range of discussions around you know that old chestnut emotional intelligence Mm -hmm. as a leader and yet we can't get to that conversation until we've dealt with all of the stressors from the business that they're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis so it's sort of like psychology 101 okay yeah. So I think I, I understand where you're coming from. I'm actually in a similar situation because obviously I'm trying to grow our business now. So I'm going to just, I'm going to share from my own personal experience here. So I'm working with a coach and the coach is working with me to develop that growth mindset to becoming, as I want to expand my team, to develop into that CEO. So what's holding me back from my own self-limiting beliefs, let's just say. At the same time, I'm working with a strategist, a consultant to work out all those other stresses that you're talking about, let's just say operations or, so it's, again, it's different people 
serving different purposes and why you would work with a coach. And sometimes it might be a consultant. So I think it's about, I don't know if this is helping your answer here, but it's about working out who to tap into for the right service, I guess I'm trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Thanks, sorry, Angela. can I just challenge Angela again? Yeah, here? of course, yes. Given the, the first thing that you'll, with a small to medium business owner, is that you'll need to establish trust, credibility, integrity. How are you going to switch them between four or five different providers um, without your relationship being um, destroyed where some other provider just simply doesn't understand that uh, that mindset. So can I just be clear, you're saying that the provider is like someone else who provides coaches slash mentoring as one whole role? I'm understanding in your situation that you're saying, okay, I have a client. I, I do a diagnostic and I identify that they need a a mindset coach and some other coach and something. I think, um, so guess one, if I can, if I can just intervene there and, and I'm mindful to the time and thank you, but, you know, I appreciate the, the, the questions you're holding. Um, I think what, where, where we're all coming from for Colleen and Angela is coaching is one intervention. Consulting is a different intervention. Training is another intervention. Mentoring is another intervention. And so one of the things that we talk about when we're actually identifying uh, and matching up, um, you know, or, or thinking about how do we support whether they're business owners, whether they're individual leaders in organisations, whether it's a one-person organisation or, you know, 20,000-person organisation, what we're looking at is what's the needs of the individual or the team or the organization. And so how do we ensure that whatever solution is being recommended is the best fit for purpose? Sometimes coaching as, as Colleen and Angela have both shared earlier, coaching is not the best solution at a particular point in time. It may need, be that we start with, um, uh, some consulting or some other, or some mentoring or something else. So I think that's the distinction um, that, that needs to be made clear. And certainly as part of the contracting um, for any relationship, that would definitely be a part of that contracting. So what's the, what is the relationship we're contracting for and what is it, what is it that's needed? in this particular case. I'm mindful, to the I'm mindful to the time. Colleen, Angela, can I ask one quick question of both of you before we, before we sort of start to wrap this up? And you know, we've had a wonderful conversation. I really thank you for your time. What do you think, if you think about the future of coaching, you know, where do you think the industry is going? And you know, from this perspective of finding and working with a coach, you know, we've got there's a zillion providers out there, there's platforms out there, there's so much going on in this space. You know, when you think about the future of coaching and, and working with coaching providers, you know, where do you think this is headed? I, yeah, can I answer that, Kelly? I, I feel like coaching is going to be and hopefully embedded into a company culture so that people lead like a coach. And I think... Um, being able to lead a team where you're using that coaching style from time to time to bring more awareness to your team and even yourself to be asking those questions is really powerful. So going forward, I, I feel as though more and more people, I'm seeing more and more people getting their certification and it's not because they want to become a coach, but they want to lead like a coach and apply what they've learned from their coaching style into their organization. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would second that, Angela. I think that um, we have made the statement to our leaders that it is one of the drivers of um, leadership or inclusive leadership that we are, um, we are measuring um, internally and we are um, enabling, um, be it through capability building or, um, or other kind of leadership development. Um, but I also am a big believer that... Um, when once you've experienced the value or the power of coaching, it really, it, it really helps you to understand why coaching others. Or if you've had a boss who can, is a great coach, who a leader who coaches, um, it's a great 
a way, great way to influence, um, you know, the, that, that the importance of it. So, and to um, hopefully continue to build it. So I always, um, I'm always, I'm, I don't think individual coaching is going to go away. I think it's going to be both. I think this blended coaching is going to continue um, in virtual coaching um, anywhere in the world. I think, you know, uh, I spoke to someone who, has just come back from Canada, working in Canada um, and other organisations, and they have a coach that they talk to twice a week. Um, it's, I said it's almost like having a little coach on your shoulder. It's almost <laughs> every decision you're making, you've got, uh, you've got this, this, this council, uh, this sort of supporter. Um, so um, very, a very expensive proposition, but um, that's, what, that's what I've not, I've not heard of that approach before. Maybe I just haven't been open to it, but, um, you know, there's, there's just going to be different different ways to do this depending on the individual and um and how much money you've got to spend i guess as well but i definitely think it's going to be an internal capability that's going to be growing um, um further and further in the future yeah well music to our ears of course angela and colleen in terms of what you're sharing today as you know iecl and our vision is to you know ensure that every you know that every leader has access to world-class coaching and that is only going to happen if our coaching, you know, our leaders are acting as coaches and bringing that coaching philosophy to life as well. In organisation, it certainly sits true with the purpose of, I know, many of us that work in IECL. Colleen, Angela, can I just thank you both very much for your time? Um, and again, absolute gratitude for showing up and, and, and speaking and sharing your, your stories with us today. Uh, I'm sure there'll be other questions from, from the, the audience. Um, if there's anything uh, that comes up that I can pass on to you, I know you'll... Um, take that in good grace but thank you again and I've been asked all of my colleagues around the around the region to give Angela and Colleen a huge round of applause thank you thank you thank, thank you. you very much Angela thanks Colleen and thanks Tony the butler <laughs>